Before I get into the message, I want to tell you about a couple. They're going on a vacation together, but the wife has an emergency, so they agreed that the husband would go ahead of time, get everything set up, and the wife would meet him the next day. When the husband got to the hotel and checked in, he thought he should send his wife an email, um, letting her know everything's okay. As he typed in the email address, he made a slight error, and his email was sent to an elderly preacher's wife instead. It just so happened that, unfortunately, her husband had died the day before. When the grieving old preacher's wife checked the email, she opened up the email this guy sent. She let out an awful, loud, piercing scream and fainted on the floor. At the sound of her falling, the family rushed into the room. They tended to her, and then they looked at the computer and saw the email. Dearest wife, just checked into my room. Everything is prepared for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> P.S., it sure is hot down here. <laughs> All right. The name of my message today is Following God's Plan for Your Life. Now, some of you may not know that we actually have a Bible school that we do here at the church. And one of the courses that they just completed is following God's plan for your life. So I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to actually preach this message to you so that you can see what is being taught in the Bible school? So when we think about that title, following God's plan for your life, it actually presumes that God has a plan for your life. Well, we're already going into that assumption that he has a plan, so we need to follow it. Well, how do we know for sure that God has a plan for us? Go over to Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah 29, 11. And this is God speaking. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. So the Bible is saying the Lord himself is telling us, I have a plan for you. That word plans means purpose. The literal Hebrew means to think, plan, calculate, invent, and imagine. So I want you to think right now that the Almighty God who created the heavens and the earth has a plan for your life, that you were created with purpose. You're not just here uh, just to get born, go to school, graduate, get married, have a family, work at a job, and die. There's more to life than just that. God took his time with you to think, to plan, to calculate, to invent, and to imagine what your life would be. We need to see how special and valuable we are. So your future has been laid out. And here's good news. You're not just a carbon copy of someone else. Your life is unique. Go over to Psalm 139. I love these verses. Psalm 139, we're going to look at 13 through 16 in the Amplified because I love the way it brings it across. And this is speaking about God again. For you formed my innermost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will give thanks and praise to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being formed in secret and intricately and skillfully formed as if embroidered with many colors in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance and in your book were written all the days that were appointed for me when as yet there was not one of them even taking shape. So what we see here is God took his time when he made you. It talks about you being knit together, embroidered with many colors. I don't know if any of you have ever, ever knitted before. All right, I watch people knit, and it seems like an incredibly long process to produce a result that I could just go to the store and buy. 
people are like, oh, I knit you a sweater. It only took me a month and a half. Really? I just uh, ordered one on Amazon. Too bad. All right? But what are they doing? They're taking their time because they want to make something special for you. That's what God did. He didn't call up Amazon and order you. He took his time to knit you together. You are unique. And here's what we need to understand. Anything that is created has purpose. So this table was created. It has a purpose. It actually allows me to place things on it so I don't have to hold them. You were created with purpose. You were designed and programmed to accomplish something. Well, what is it? I mean, I, if, if God created you for a reason, you need to figure out what it is. Notice what it says again in Jeremiah, God speaking, I know the plans I have for you. This is God speaking. He says, I know why I created you. Everything that God does is with intent and purpose. So God is saying, I know why you were created, but the question is, do you know why you were created? Because if we don't know, we're just going to be wandering through life, not achieving the goals or purpose that God has for us. You can't fulfill your destiny if you don't know what it is. And the Bible says that when we fulfill those plans, it gives us a purpose, a hope for the future. I like that. I like to know that I'm here for a reason. Now, the key to fulfilling the purpose in which you were created is following God's plan for your life. Some people get so caught up following their own plan that they miss out on God's plan. Go over to Proverbs 14.12. Proverbs 14.12. says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So there's things that we may be doing in life. They seem right. But is it God's plan for us? Or is it our plan? The Bible says if we get off track, we could go down a path that leads to death. That word death there means destruction, ruin, or it could mean a violent death. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want my life being in ruin and destruction. Some people just complain, I can't understand why so-and-so, it seems like everything they do just shines and my life just seems awful. Are you on the right plan that God has for you? Certain decisions we make in life can completely alter our future toward disaster. That's not what God wants. He wants you to have a plan that gives you a future and hope. It says there is a way that seems right to a man. That word way means a walk, a journey, a path, a road, a course. You know, I have discovered that life consists of many paths, there's many roadblocks that we can take. I remember when I graduated from high school, I had to make a crucial decision because I knew God called me into the ministry. So there was a multitude of things I could do. I could go to Bible school. I could uh, go to a regular college. Or this minister wanted me to hook up with him and do a traveling tent ministry across the country. So there's three things. None of them seem bad, but what's the right course? What is the course that God has for me? The key to life is going down the right path. The choices that you make in life today determine the future that you will possess tomorrow. See, a lot of you are where you are today based on decisions that you made years ago. And how do you feel about your life? Are you happy with it? Is it the life that God has for you? If not, we need to make different choices. Sometimes we find out where God wants us, and we don't like the path that he's chosen for us. 
Well, here's the interesting thing. God will never force you to do anything. He will reveal his plan to you, but you can make a choice to say, mm, I don't want to do that. I'm going to do this instead. And God will be like, okay. Well, why does he do that? Because he created us as free moral agents. You're not robots. You have a choice. I would suggest that you choose to follow God's path. Let's look at Jesus in a certain situation. Go over to Matthew 26. Matthew 26, we're going to look at verses 36 and 38 through 39. And this is right before Jesus is going to end up going to the cross. It says, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further, fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, I find that interesting because it indicates Jesus had a will. Sometimes we think Jesus just came down and he just he had to do everything that God wanted him to do. But he, even in his sayings, said, I don't do, I choose to do what my Father wills. Right here, he says, Lord, I'd prefer not to go through this. If it's really up to me, I'm not really into getting whipped, beaten, spit upon, punched, and nailed to the cross. I'd rather not do that. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you. Jesus is saying, Lord, I'm not going to follow the plan that I have for my life. I'm going to follow your plan. That word will there means to be resolved or determined to intend to purpose. So what Jesus is saying is not as I intend or purpose, but as you intend or purpose for my life. He chose to follow God's plan for his life not his own. When we submit our lives to the will of God, we open ourselves up to God's plan and purpose for our existence. And I'll tell you right now, when you're following the plan of God for your life, there's joy. There is a joy. There's frustration when you keep going down the wrong path and it seems like nothing is turning out right. That's frustrating. God doesn't want us living in a frustrated situation. He's looking for believers who will dedicate and consecrate their lives to carry out his plans for them. One of the characteristics in the last days, and you can look at 2 Timothy 3 sometime, and it lists a whole bunch of characteristics in the last days, and most of them you see blatantly right now. But one of the primary ones is that people will be selfish and think only of themselves. How many of you have run into people like that? How many of you are sitting next to us? No, don't raise your hand on that one. But people are selfish. We think only of ourselves. And when we think of ourselves, when we're looking at ourselves, guess who we're not looking at? God. See, God is looking. He wants people who are fully surrendered to his will. Lord, what do you got for me? What do you want me to do? I'll do whatever it takes. Isaiah said, here I am, Lord. Send me. Use me. Take me. That's who God is looking for. Go over to Hebrews 12, and we'll look at verse 1. Sometimes there's things that will try to throw you off the path that God has for you. Hebrews 12.1 says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. I find that interesting that the Bible says that we are to run the race that is set before us, which means God has a particular race for you to run in life. And your race is not the same as someone else's race. 
So you got to figure out what track you're supposed to be on. This is your divine destiny that God has called you to fulfill. And here's the other thing. If you're going to run a race, you're not only supposed to run it, you're actually supposed to finish it. How many of us start something and we give up? It looks really amazing. Oh, man, I'm going to get involved in this. And we do it for a week and like, okay, next. We either get bored or we get tired or we just don't want to do it. See, this is your life. This is your destiny. Imagine if Jesus said, yeah, I'm so tired of trying to be the Messiah here. None of the other kids' parents are telling their kids they're the Messiah. Why do I have to be the Messiah? That's a lot of weight on my shoulders. But he saw his path, and he continued. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, this is Paul speaking. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul said, I finished the race. What does that mean? He says, I have fulfilled the intent and purpose that God had for me in my life. I hope we all can get to the end of our life and be able to say that. But I'm going to tell you right now, it's not easy. It's not easy because there's all kinds of things that are trying to stop you from doing that. In fact, it's interesting, and I hadn't really looked at it this way before, but notice how it starts out, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. So what he's indicating is that there is a fight to be fought in order for you to finish the race that God has called you to. There will be obstacles and things to distract you and dissuade you. Following God's plan for your life requires a determination to keep going regardless of the obstacles that come to your path. Uh, look, this is interesting. It fits so perfectly, you'd almost think I was making it up. But it says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. That word race in the Hebrew, one of the words is battle. It's battle, which means that you have to be willing to fight to see your dreams fulfilled in life. There's a saying, nothing great ever came that easy. Nothing great. And I'll tell you right now, one of the biggest hindrances to following God's plan for your life is, are you ready? People. People. It is so interesting how you will reveal God's plan for you and people will try to talk you out of it. Oh, you don't want to do that. That's not a good thing. I remember years ago I read a book by A.W. Tozer called I Talk Back to the Devil, which I picked it up because I thought that title sounded interesting. And he says in there, why is it when you're sitting around doing nothing, nobody bothers you? But the immediate of you saying, okay, I'm going to go and do this for God, at least three or four people will tell you you're crazy. Why? Because people don't want to be convicted by their inactivity. They don't want to see you going out and doing something for God when they know they're just sitting around doing nothing. I get to deliver groceries to people, and uh, some of them have dogs, which don't like me being there. And, and I mean, I, I'm at this one house. I, if, you, if I disappear, know that it's this dog that got me. <laughs> I go up to this house. This dog is charging at the glass window, like scratching it. I'm waiting for the thing to break. He's just barking and barking. Now, I've had issues with dogs my whole life. I remember when I was a kid, I used to walk to school, walk past this neighbor. He had a fence, and his dog would always bark. And I'm like, well, what is wrong? Why are these dogs barking? And then I learned, you want to know why dogs bark? This, this is gold. This is the nugget of today. Dogs bark because you're going somewhere, and they're not. 
people will bark at you because you're going somewhere and they're not. Do not allow people to hinder you or hold you back from what God is calling you to do. Another hindrance that could hold us back. It says, let us run with endurance, or some translations say patience, the race that is set before us. We need patience if we're going to follow the plan of God for our life. Because God's timetable is not the same as ours. We in America have it the worst. Because we want everything immediately. Give it to me now. We want high-speed internet. I mean, I remember when you had to call and put the phone on the modem and wait. Ring, ring, come on. Now somebody has to wait two seconds. What's wrong with this internet? I want it now. We want instant money, so we go to ATMs. People don't even go into the bank anymore. We want instant breakfast. That's why they have Pop-Tarts. Just put it in. We want instant plans fulfilled. Let's go. I don't want to have to wait for this thing. Well, we need to recognize God doesn't operate on our timetable. Abraham waited 25 years for the plan of God to be fulfilled in his life. Most of us couldn't wait 25 minutes. We'd be like, okay, God, you're not coming through. I'm going on to something next. Some of us, we get frustrated in traffic in Naples. I know I do. Somebody doesn't uh, start their car right away when the light turns green. Matt, Matt, come on. It's like we're beeping at God. Beep, beep, God, get a move on. I got things to do. Other things than what you want me to do. Paul waited 11 years from the time he was on the road to Damascus and the Lord spoke to him till he went off into ministry. 11 years. Jesus, 30 years. Why? Because during that time, God wants to properly prepare you so that you're ready to do what he's called you to do and you don't give up easily. Another thing, don't try to make God's plan for your life come to pass by your own efforts. If we look at, if you go see this movie, Unsung Hero, this family comes from Australia the father is a Christian promoter. So he thinks he's coming to promote a Christian act in America and then finds out the act went with someone else. All of a sudden, everything he thought, completely gone. So he tries to force certain things to happen to make this plan of God come true. When, when actually God had a totally different plan for him. He, he never saw, he never realized that the real plan of coming to America was that his own children would end up in the music ministry and his daughter would become Rebecca St. James and his sons would become for king and country. We need to make sure that we don't try to help God. Any of us ever do that? We're like, God, apparently you got a lot going on, so let me help you with this plan you have for my life. Abraham tried to do that. He got tired of waiting, so he had Ishmael. And now we see all kinds of craziness still going on between Israel and the Arabs because of that little mistake. Moses knew that God had called him to deliver the people, but he tried to help God out by killing an Egyptian. And what did that do? That ended up prolonging his delivering of the Israelites because he had to flee into the wilderness. It didn't stop God's plan, but it delayed it. I don't want to delay what God has for me. Let's go back to Hebrews 12.1. I want to read this from the Living Bible. It says, let us strip off anything that slows us down or holds us back, 
especially those sins that wrap themselves so tightly around our feet and trip us up. And let us run with patience the particular race that God has set before us. Sin in your life will slow you down. It will keep tripping you up and prevent you from running your spiritual race. The Bible says, strip off anything that slows you down and holds you back. So besides sin, there may be other things in your life. They're not necessarily wrong, but they're slowing you down. They're holding you back. You may not be running the race that God told you to run. So I want to make sure that I'm on my race for life, not somebody else's. You are not to run somebody else's race or finish somebody else's course. You are unique. God created you specifically with intent and purpose for your life. So how do you figure out, okay, well, we got it now. God has a plan for us. We should follow it. We should keep going no matter what. How do I find out what God's plan is for my life? I mean, how do I figure that out? Well, God wants to speak to you about the plan he has. We are in danger of missing it if we don't learn how to listen and obey his voice. The more time you spend with God, the more you're liable to recognize how he speaks. Look at Romans 8.14. Romans 8.14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And that word sons there refers to mature sons. So if you want to mature in your walk and relationship with God, you need to learn how to be led by the Spirit. God contacts and deals with us through our spirit. We are a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. So he speaks to you through your spirit, not through your emotions or your intellect or anything like that. Now notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, and this is just not for any of you in here but those watching online. It doesn't say as many as are led by prophets or someone else telling them what to do. God wants to speak to you about your life. Quit following what other people are telling you that have no idea what your life is about. So how does the Spirit lead us? We're going to look at three ways. Number one is referred to as the inward witness. The inward witness. In Romans 8, 16, it says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So being led by the inward witness is the number one way that God leads his children. Now, what is the inward witness? Very simply, it is a spiritual sense or check in your spirit. So it's like a red light or a stop signal that says, don't do that. You ever feel like you were supposed to do something and all of a sudden something inside just saying, no, don't, don't, stop, ho, oh, oh, ho, hold on. You're about to get involved in some crazy scheme. No, don't do it. Or it could be a green light that is the go-ahead signal that says, okay, everything's good. You need to learn to listen to that. Sometimes we just pass that off as, oh, that's nothing. As you learn to develop your spirit and follow the inward witness, then he will guide you in every area of your life. Second, the inward voice. Romans 9.1. With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. So the second way the Spirit guides us is by an inward voice. It's really the inward man, the spirit man, has a voice which we call our conscience. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, years ago, it was one of those pivotal things. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I didn't have a job. I was with the ministry. Uh, it was 2008. 
economy was awful. Uh, they couldn't afford to pay us anymore. Uh, so we're sitting there, what should we do? What should we do? And, and somebody said, you could come down. We actually went to Georgia to stay with some friends because we were at the point where we didn't want to pay for rent again because we didn't know where we were going. So someone said, come to Georgia. You can stay with us for a couple weeks. So we're there. We're trying to figure it out. And this guy from Texas calls. He says, listen, I think my pastor would like you. I can't guarantee a job, but why don't you come down, hang out. He can get to know you, and then we can go from there. So we thought, okay, well, we'll do it. So that night we packed the whole car. We're ready to get up in the morning and head from Georgia to Texas. And we get up, and it's raining, and I just felt like this voice was saying, don't do it. Don't go. Like, it didn't make sense because this was a possibility. I didn't have anything else to do. But it's like you just hear that inner voice. It's not an audible voice, but it's an inner voice saying, no, don't do it. So we didn't. We didn't do it. And if we would have, I don't know what would have happened, but it wouldn't have been the right path because I know everything that we've went through brought us to where we are now. In 1 Kings 19, it says this, then he said, go out, and this is speaking of Elijah, go out and stand before the mountain of the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind tore into the mountain and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. We think when God's going to speak to us, like the roof is just going to blow off, and all of a sudden angels are singing, hallelujah, and, and God, this is the Lord. This is what I want you to do. No, most of the time when God is speaking to you, it's not the wind, it's not the earthquake, it's not the fire, it's a still, small voice. And that phrase, still, small voice, means a delicate, whispering voice. See, the problem is we're so bombarded listening to everything else that we can't hear the voice of God. He's speaking to you. He wants to speak to you, but you've got to take time to listen. And again, the more that you grow in the Lord, the more sensitive your conscience will become. And I'll tell you this, if your conscience convicts you and tells you not to do something, listen. Listen to it. Let's look at the last way that the Lord speaks, the voice of the Holy Spirit. The voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, when the Holy Spirit speaks within you, it is more authoritative. Sometimes it seems like an audible voice, but it isn't necessarily audible. I'm just going to paraphrase this in 1 Samuel 3. Samuel's serving the Lord under Eli's direction. And he hears a voice, Samuel, Samuel. And he runs to Eli. What is it? Eli's asleep. What is it? Eli's like, I didn't call you. Go to bed. And again, he goes back to bed. He hears Samuel, Samuel. He runs back to Eli. What do you want? What's going on? He's like, I didn't call you. Hit the road. He goes back to bed. Third time, Samuel, Samuel. He, he goes back, Eli, what are you doing? What, what's going on here? And now Eli realizes it's God speaking. He says, next time you hear that voice, simply say, speak. I'm your servant, ready to listen. See, when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, it can seem audible. But notice Eli didn't hear it. But it was strong to him. It was a strong voice to him. I'll share the probably best example I have personally of this. We were having revival meetings at a church that I used to go to in Wisconsin. We went three weeks in a row, like every night. We saw over 10,000 people in the city of Milwaukee get saved. It was booming. It was crazy. It was incredible. And then the guy doing the revival means leaving, but the pastor wanted to continue. 
He said, I don't want to stop the flow of what's going on. My wife's like, I can't keep going to those meetings. Like the laundry isn't getting done like this. Like there's practical things that have to be done. I said, okay, you stay home. I'm going to go and support the pastor's decision. So he's up there preaching. And I hear a voice. Again, it's not audible because nobody else hears it. But I hear, go up and pray for the pastor. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I am a person that follows protocol. Let everything be done decently in order. It's not my service. I'm not getting up and stopping the service. Again, I hear this voice, get up and pray for the pastor. And I'm thinking, no, I'm not doing it. It ain't happening. Third time, it's like super clear. Get up and pray for the pastor. I'm like, Lord, I don't care if this is you. I am not stopping this service, all right? You can rebuke me however you want. Immediately when I stop, the pastor looks at me. He goes, Rob, come up here. And I'm thinking, whoa, I'm getting blessed. He has a blessing for me. Like, I just disobeyed the Holy Spirit, but I'm going to get blessed. That's what I'm thinking. So he goes, God told me you're supposed to pray for me. And it was confirmation to me that the Lord said, now you know what my voice sounds like, so make sure in the future that you follow it. The voice of God will always bring peace when he speaks it to you. So we've talked about how God has a plan specifically designed for every one of you, how to submit to that plan, things that can hinder that plan, and how to receive that plan. Now all you have to do is follow God's plan for your life. Amen.